Jonah has been a good book for us. It has been uh, a book where we are reminded by the grace of God. If you remember, uh, we've said that Jonah really, in many ways, uh, is, is kind of the overarching theme of the Bible. We run, and God chases us down. It's his great grace. And so Jonah, in chapter 1, has run from God. Chapter 2, he prays to God. Uh, in chapter 3, where we've been, he finally gets into Nineveh. He proclaims the message that God has given him, and it's a message of repentance. It's also a message of grace. And this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're only going to read two verses this morning. And so please stand with me as we read from Jonah chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. As a backdrop, um, Jonah has proclaimed the message that God has given him from the word of the Lord. And now the king, by his decree and through his nobles, has declared a fast and a wearing of sackcloth and sitting in ashes and calls the people to turn from all of their evil violence that's in their hands. And then in verse 9, it reads this. Who knows? Speaking from the king. God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Lord, we pray that you would be with us this morning, that you would remove distraction, that you would remove fear, that you would remove any stone that exists in our heart to hear from you, that you would soften our minds, our ears, Lord, our, our very being to hear from you, to allow you to mold us and to shape us into your image, that we would not be just a common people, we would be a people that are made in your image, living by decree of your gospel, sharing grace with those who need it. Would you please be very real and tangible to us this morning? We need you desperately. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning is Fierce Anger, Fierce Mercy, and Fierce Worship. They're really the three points of my message in fact, we don't have time this morning because we'll get into it next week. We see a different kind of anger in chapter 4, and that is the anger of Jonah. In fact, some of you may have titles over your Bible and in chapter 4. For instance, mine reads, Jonah's anger. Jonah is frustrated with God because God is going to give the people a fierce mercy, a radical mercy, a, a kind of grace that, that should not make sense in our minds because it's only a grace that God completely understands. Jonah's anger does not accomplish the righteousness of God, nor does our anger accomplish the righteousness of God. I realize this is apparent. I have become painfully aware of the reality that my parental anger doesn't always produce the greatest fruit amongst my children. However, there is a kind of anger, a righteous anger, a real anger, and the reality of God's anger. Now, oftentimes in churches, especially if they are seeker-sensitive as such, it is kind of a taboo thing to speak of the anger of God, the wrath of God, the fierceness of God, maybe some of those emotions that we deem a little bit not, not gracious and not loving. In fact, in Christianity, some will even go as far as saying that there's a different God in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament, detaching themselves, moving away from the God of the Old Testament, because the kind of God that we see on the cross, the kind of God that dies for our sins, cannot be the kind of God that rains fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah. It can't be the kind of God that allows men and women and even a city like this to burn because of their sins. But nonetheless, I want to share with you this morning that the God of the Old Testament is still the God of the New. That they're intertwined, they're connected, they're one. They're not different. In fact, some may think that there's no grace in the Old Testament, and there is. In fact, if you remember, God first frees the people from their slavery from Pharaoh, and then after he frees them by grace, then he gives the law. It's always grace first, and then your response to that grace, the law. So God does have a kind of anger and wrath. Here's a few things we need to understand about this. Again, we're pulling this from Jonah chapter 3, verse 9. Who knows, God may turn and relent from his what? It's a fierce anger. 
It's a terrible anger. It's a holy anger. Here's what we need to understand about his wrath and his anger. Number one, his wrath, his anger is always justified. It is always justified. It's a righteous anger. It's God's uncompromisingly holy kind of anger. Romans 2.5 says, because of your hard and unrepentant heart, right? Remember, we spent a few weeks talking about repentance. You were storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Romans chapter 2 verse 5 is in the New Testament, to be clear. And it speaks of God's wrath. And the Old Testament, Proverbs 24 verse 12 says, does he who not weighs the heart, speaking of God, weighing the heart, looking into your heart, that God has the ability to look into you and he weighs that heart. It's speaking of a judgment, a righteous kind of judgment. And as he weighs your heart, it goes on to say, does not he who keeps watch of your soul know it and will he not repay man according to his work? It's a righteous kind of wrath. What do, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that that. We would all say in this, mor this morning, I believe, I think as a culture as a whole, we would say that the evildoer should be punished for their evil. If, for instance, we knew a man was in this room and we knew that he committed murder, we in this room would say he needs to pay for doing that, right? Now, the problem that we have with God's wrath and anger is then we have this view of ourselves that, that is unlike the murder. When, when we say, wait a minute, God's going to judge the world. He's going, he's going to bring his wrath upon the world. But that does not seem loving unless you understand the condition of man. See, we, we have a tendency to put the image of God, our own image, on the image of God and think to ourselves that we actually are the right judge. So we look at a child and we look at that child who may fall under some kind of punishment and, and we'd say, that's just unfair. He's so young and, and he's so little and, and how could that be right? The reality of this is that you and I are horrible judges. We don't know all the details. We don't have the knowledge of eternity past. Everyone in this room, I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume the oldest person in here is uh, 60. Does that make some people feel good? <laughs> not going to go higher than that, um, knowing that there may be someone that's a little older than 60. And if, if, if you are that wise, you have a particular kind of knowledge. I turn 40 next month. You have 20 years on me, some of you more, we're just being nice. And I don't have that wisdom yet. I've got 40 years, you've got 60, and you've gathered 60 years of knowledge. And then whatever knowledge that you have outside of your own experience, you've gathered from reading or from some kind of absorption from your parents. Uh, but nonetheless, none of you in this room really have more than 60 years of knowledge. Do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying is you have just a little bit of knowledge. God has all of it. He has hundreds, thousands of years. You'd even say millions because he knows the future. He knows all of it. He's outside of time. And so God is the only one who can judge whether it's right or wrong for someone to die, for someone to come under some kind of wrath, for the occurrence of Sodom and Gomorrah to happen. See, we look at something like Sodom and Gomorrah, especially in our culture, and we say, wait a minute, there was the practice of homosexuality. There was the practice of radical sin. There's the practice of evildoers. And all of this stuff is happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then God allows a fireball to come from the heavens to obliterate Sodom and Gomorrah. And there would be those in the culture today who would say, wait a minute, that's not loving. That's not kind. We must redefine who God is. And the problem with that is they're, in their minds, they're saying, I would be a better judge than God. Who are you? to say who gets mercy, who gets grace, who gets wrath, and who gets punishment. So you have to place yourself where Jonah eventually finally came to. If you remember at the end of chapter 2, salvation belongs to the Lord. God knows more than me. God understands more than me. He weighs the heart, as it says in Proverbs, and he gives to that heart exactly what it needs. Whatever that is, God is the judge. Even in our court systems, which I'm familiar with, both of my fathers, my biological father and the one who raised me, both did time in prison, in jail. 
And you see the injustices, the imperfect judgment, the, the sometimes right judgment. And then if you know anything about the court system, you say to yourself, wait a minute, this person got five years for this and this other person got 15 years for, for this. That doesn't make any sense. Why? Because judges are imperfect. But God's judgment is always perfect and always just. J.I. Packer says, God's wrath in the Bible is never capricious, self-indulgent, irritable, morally ignoble thing that human anger so often is. It is instead a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. This is from knowing God. See, the reality we have to understand is what's happening within Nineveh is that God's fierce anger is completely just. It's completely right. We've spent time speaking and, and, and talking about the reality of how violent Nineveh was. In Nineveh, it was a religious practice for the king to do a couple different things. One, the practice of the king in Nineveh, which was the uh, capital of Assyria, one of the most violent nations ever. It, it was the practice of, for religion to appease their gods that the king would erect uh, in his own image a statue of himself. So within Nineveh and through Assyria, you would find these statues of these kings, and there would be inscriptions upon these statues, and it was their, their job to, to share their conquests, to boast of the kind of king they were, the way that they ruled. And it was a way to not only look at the king as, look at, he is, he is awesome, he is great, he, he's almost like deity, but it was also a way, if you were visiting within Assyria, to be reminded, be very fearful of Assyria. One of those inscriptions reads like this. I felled 50 of their fighting men with the sword. I burnt 200 captives from them. And I defeated in battle on the plain 332 troops. With their blood, I dyed the mountain red like red wool. The rest of them, the ravens, the torrents of the mountains swallowed. I then carried off the captives and their possessions from them. I cut off their heads. And I built with them a tower before their city. I burnt their adolescent boys and girls. In strife and conflict, I besieged and conquered the city. I felled 3,000 of their fighting men with the sword. I, captive, I captured many troops alive. I cut off some of their arms and hands. I cut off others' noses and ears and extremities. I gouged out the eyes of many troops. I made one pile of the living and one, one pile of the living and one pile of their heads. I hung their heads on trees around the city. This is the kind of place that Jonah was called to be a missionary. Some of you think you think it's hard to evangelize your coworkers. All of this to be said, Nineveh deserves a fierce anger. This is their culture. This is their people. This is who they have become. God's ultimate wrath and judgment is to be understood as just and correct. One thing that we share in regards to salvation, many people have an issue with, is, is this idea that God predestined some to be the elect, that he saw those that he was going to die for on the cross, and he chose to die for them to guarantee their salvation. And some people would say that that just seems so unfair that God would do that. That God would predestine some, but he wouldn't predestine others. It isn't until we understand that we're actually coming to it from the wrong direction. It isn't how is that fair. It's, it's how is it that any gets saved at all? The question we should ask is, is, why would God save anybody? When in the reality is that all of us are sinners, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, right? We're, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. All of us inside of our hearts are adulterous people. God likens all sin, all of it, to adultery. There are passages in the Bible that read like this. And I'm not stretching the truth. This is the Scripture. So if you're offended by what I say, you have to go to the author who wrote it. God speaking to Israel calls Israel whores. You are filled with whoredom, he says. Underneath every terebinth tree, you have spread your legs before other gods.
He isn't just speaking of a sexual kind of sin. He's speaking of sin in general, like turning away from God, turning away from your attention and, and your dedication to him. And he's saying, that sin, it's like you cheating on me. I'm your husband, he says. I'm your God. You're to worship me. And instead, you have run and slept with so many other lovers. God is just in his wrath. It is to be respected. The question isn't, how is it that, that, that God doesn't save everybody? Because we know not everyone gets saved. It's, it's, why would he choose anybody at all? Why is there grace at all? When in reality, God would be completely justified to send all of us to the place that we all deserve. He'd be completely justified. Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, is an argument against the reality of hell. <laughs> Another book that you might want to write is God's Wrath Wins. It could be an argument that we're all going to hell. You, I think, through Scripture, could make a clearer argument that all of mankind deserves the burning heap of hell rather than you could make an argument for heaven itself. But nonetheless, God practices His great wrath and great mercy. A couple things we need to understand about this wrath. Number two, Point two, that his wrath is, number one is his wrath is just. Point two, that his wrath is to be respected. We have to understand that there's a justified reason to this and honor it and respect it, that God has an emotional response to the injustices of the world. And to that, we should say, thank you, God. As I shared earlier, the wrath of God, this is number three, is not just an Old Testament thing. It's also the New Testament. Let me read another one from the New Testament, Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men by their unrighteousness suppressing the truth. As one pastor says, from the Bible that the wrath of God is eternal, this is speaking again of his wrath, from the Bible the description of his wrath is it's eternal, it's terrible, it's deserved, it is not escapable, because of death, but it is, I'm sorry, it is escapable because of the death and resurrection of Christ. Let the Apostle John remind us of how terrible and eternal the wrath of God is with just one of his most dreadful images in Revelations chapter 19, verse 15. Another New Testament verse describes Christ in his second coming. When Jesus comes back again for his church, when he, this is the description. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. <laughs> oh yeah, this will put a smile on your face. He's coming back. The first time he came to bear the cross. The second time he will come bearing a sword. Within this description, we see that he is God Almighty in Revelations 19.15. He's not a weak God. He's not a passive God. He's not a static God. He is God Almighty. He has all the power in the universe. All of it. All atomic power, all electromagnetic power, all gravitational power, all the power in the greatest explosions that are ever or have ever been amongst the greatest stars of space. He has all of it. Number four, God's wrath is a loving response to sin. Schumann says, I think I have a, oh, I'm sorry, I do not have a slide for this. God is love, and God does all things for his glory. He loves his glory above all, and that is a good thing. Therefore, God rules the world in such a way that brings himself maximum glory. This means that God must act justly and judge sin, responding in wrath. Otherwise, God would not be God. God's love for his glory motivates his wrath against sin. Admittedly, God's love for his own glory is a most sobering reality for many and not good news for sinners. It is, after all, a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Hebrews 10.31. When God punishes something that is wicked, it puts an end to that. That is a loving response. And number five, speaking of God's wrath and understanding God's wrath, I kind of posed as a question. Why is it then that it seems that the wrath of God is more prevalent in the Old Testament than it is in the New Testament? Is it because God has been napping in his wrath? Is it because that God doesn't respond the same way? Has he changed his mind according to sin? Is he just, just more okay with all of the social injustices that exist in the world? 
My answer to you this morning is, would be this, the gospel. The gospel teaches us that the wrath of God has been satisfied upon one person and one person alone, Christ. We no longer see wrath like we do in Sodom and Gomorrah, though, though some may argue that is what natural disasters are, and I'm not God, I can't say that that is the case. Some kind of explosion, terrorism, what have you, some, some pastors would preach and they would share with you, that is God showing his wrath and anger against the injustices of the world. And maybe that is the case. However, I think there's a bigger wrath to come. But the focus this morning would be that the wrath of God has been satisfied upon Christ. This anger has been satisfied in Christ. And Jonah, we see, because Jonah is a picture of Christ, one man suffering in the belly of the whale, that a whole nation would come to know the grace of God. One man experiencing the wrath of God in a whale so that the rest of the nation would experience the grace of God. And likewise for us as Christians and for the world who believe in Jesus Christ, one man has taken the wrath of God that you and I would experience the great mercy of God. As it reads in 1 John 2, 2, that he, speaking of Christ, is the propitiation for our sins. Do you know what propitiation means? A wrath-bearing sacrifice. Big Christian word, propitiation. I'm sure you use it at least once a week. <laughs> this may be the first time you've ever heard the word. Propitiation literally means that God in Christ became the wrath-bearing sacrifices for our sins. This, my friends, brings us not to just this reality that God's anger is fierce. God's mercy is fierce. It is radical. It is un 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 understandable to a certain degree that you and I can realize that God loves us in such a way that, that, that is beyond comprehension. One pastor says this. God is more ready to forgive than you are to repent. His forgiveness stands at the door. Why did they get 40 days? Why did Nineveh get 40 days? So they would respond. Why did God share his anger and wrath and a message that his anger was coming? Because it wasn't a call that he was going to punish them. It was a call that he would wipe his wrath away if they would respond in faith to him. So God relents. In essence, this really is a third message on repentance. This is God Repenting, not like man. Man has to repent from sin. God is repenting from his decision to destroy Nineveh. And some would ask the question, well, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. Isn't God immutable? Isn't God unchangeable? He's changed his mind here. No, he hasn't. He's actually establishing who he is. If you are unrepentant and you don't respond to God, you get wrath. If you repent, he has to give you grace and mercy because that's who he is. That's his person. If he didn't change his mind, then he would be a God that was changing his mind. God has to respond to his people when they do what they exa what exactly what he wanted them to do. They turned from their evil way. They relented. They repented. Lamentations 3.23 reads, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Amen. They are fresh every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's mercy, God's call to repenting of sin is just as frequent as your sin. For every sin, there's an opportunity to repent. For every sin, there's the opportunity to experience His grace and mercy. It just never stops. It's never ending. It's never unyielding. Joel chapter 2 verse 12 says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me, repent, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. 
This is, all, this is so, so appropriate for Nineveh. It's so appropriate for you. The city deserves to be destroyed. The world would be a better place if Nineveh did not exist. Are you with me? Do you know where Nineveh is right now? Iraq. It's the birthplace of ISIS. It's still a place of terrorism. In fact, unfortunately, I think it's 150 years after this, Nineveh returns back to its vomit. But for those within 100 years, however long it took, there were those who experienced God's grace. I would tell you, I think, that the world would be a better place without Nineveh, but the world would be an even better place with a repentant Nineveh. The world would be a better place without some of you this morning. Another put a smile on your face kind of statement. But the world is a much better place with a repentant you. Someone who has turned from their sin and has turned from God. Someone who understands the mercy of God and shares mercy. This, this, my friends, is a shocking response of God, this mercy he gives his people. It's a fierce anger that God has. It's real. His anger is real in the Old Testament. It's real in the New. But his mercy is also permeated throughout all of Scripture. In chapter 1, if you remember, he grants mercy to the sailors, pagan sailors. Chapter 2, he gives mercy to Jonah. He spits him out of the whale. Chapter 3, the king gets mercy. Are you understanding the theme? For every sin, there's mercy. God's plan for his elect, God's plan for you and I, comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Listen carefully. For God has not destined us for wrath. Everyone say amen. That is not my plan for you as my elect, he says, for my chosen and beloved ones. For God has not destined us for wrath, but he has destined us to something, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, because of this, what's the response? Encourage one another. Could we use some encouragement? Well, after a few of my statements, you're like, you might want to try it yourself, Pastor Jesse. Could you? <laughs> Our, and therefore, encourage one another, build one another up. Just as you're doing, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you, who are in the Lord and who admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace amongst yourselves. Why? Because you're at peace with God. He's no longer against you. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seeks to do good to one another and everyone. Do you see what he's saying? He's sharing with us that there's a destination that we have in Christ Jesus. And because of this destination, we should respond in a particular kind of way. God's wrath, my friends, is not for you. Have you ever done something that you felt like, oh yeah, I deserve whatever consequences come? And sometimes they do. If you don't believe me, just try speeding around Truckee for a day. I'm sure eventually one of the traffic policemen will stop you and give you a ticket. I know of one in the area that will definitely give you a ticket. I don't know that from experience. I'm lying. It's been a while. And yet God still responds in grace. I recently came across uh, a pastor that, that I had just come to love his teaching. I've quoted him in here on many occasions. Just recently, he came out and said when he first planted his church, he had cheated on his wife. And again, most recently. Two different times, he's committed adultery. This is a man that during his adulterous relationship still stood at the pulpit, still preached in a way that made people respond He was in a thriving church, a growing church, an amazing church, a biblically-centered church, a gospel-centered church, everything that you could ask for. Jesus was proclaimed. Man was not set up on stage. And he came and he admitted, I have sinned this entire time. I have been in sin. And some of us would look at that and say, how in the world, why in the world would God continue to, to bless that church and to bless this man? Because he is a merciful God. And it's not about that man. It's about the message the man was proclaiming. Just because a sinful man proclaimed it did not make the message untrue. 
Oftentimes when we've had this happen to us, that we, we have books in our bookstore and the pastor falls and he sends and, and then the first question the elders ask, well, what do we do with his books? We got to take them off the shelf and throw them away. As if somehow those books no longer hold truth within them because the man's name is attached to it. My friends, if that is our response, we don't understand the gospel for David was a great sinner. Moses was a great sinner. Peter was a great sinner. Paul was a great sinner. All deserving of wrath, not deserving of proclaiming the word of God, not deserving of evangelizing, but deserving God's fierce anger. But because of God's fierce mercy, he still uses imperfect souls. My friends, your sin is no excuse not to serve. So what do we do? We should fiercely worship. God has a fierce anger but he has an even fiercer kind of mercy for his grace is always bigger. And our response should be to fiercely respond to that wrath and mercy with, number one, a holy fear of awe, respect, and reverence of God. There should be something to be said when we say, okay, why, why do we stand during the reading of Scripture? It's one way to respond with honor. Psalm 114, 7, tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord. Psalm 119, 120, my flesh trembles for you. Isaiah 66, 2, this is the one to whom I look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit, and he trembles at my word. What he says in Isaiah, the kind of person that God looks to, the kind of person that God gives grace to, is the kind of person who trembles at his word. There's something about the proclamation of God's word that should call us to a humility a awe and respect that God would speak to us. In the New Testament, the same thing continues. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, so now not only as in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with what? Who knows the piece of Scripture? Fear and trembling. One pastor says to add to this, because some of you are thinking to yourselves, why should I fear God? Don't fear God as your enemy, because that he is not. Fear him as the one who was once your enemy and still is an infinite power to destroy you and all of his holiness. Fear him because he can and he would, but he doesn't. It's in awe. There's this great illustration I came across this week depicting this. If you were stranded on a windy ledge 50 stories above the street, and you were about to lose your balance, and suddenly a policeman grabbed you and brought you into safety inside the building, you would not stop trembling just because you were safe, would you? Picture it in your mind. You're about to fall over the edge to certain death. Your heart pumps. Your gut goes, Ugh! someone grabs you, pulls you into the building. The height is still in your mind, isn't it? The wind is still in your mind, the weakness and vulnerability are still in your mind, but now you're totally secure. This trembling is different than when you were on the ledge. See, our salvation is the same way. We're once falling to a most certain demise, a certain wrath. Jesus in his sovereignty pulls us from that, gives us grace, gives us compassion, gives us mercy. In our minds, we should still remember what it was like to be falling. So this should change in us our reverence for God. And our second response should be a change in our corporate worship. Why do I say this? Because it changed the corporate worship of Nineveh. As a whole, as a family, they once were worshiping not one God, but many gods. Then together as a whole, even the animals repent. Do you remember? Even the animals go through a fast. Oh, hungry sheep, hungry cows moaning, bemoaning their state. As a whole, Nineveh changed their corporate worship. Corporate worship, what we do on a Sunday, is the experience of coming corporately and consciously before the face of God. It should change the way that we sing. It should change the way that we respond on Sundays. One quote says, but now here is a great fear-transforming reality and explains why Christians sing with joy in worship and Muslims don't. 
Fear and trembling are not because God is our enemy, but because he saved us from the wrath through Christ. And now we stand on the brink of the grand canyon of his holiness and justice and grace and wrath with unspeakable wonder, knees wobbling, hands trembling, but overcome with worship at the depth of his majesty, not with worry that we may fall in to that wrath. When we sing, we should be singing of this reality. It should change the way that we praise God. Should it not? It's this wonder. This is what caused the heart to move. It causes the heart to be stirred. I deserve hell, but God gives me himself instead? There's no more radical extreme, is there? You deserve eternal separation from God, and yet God comes and closes the gap upon the cross, and he brings you not into wrath, but into great mercy and kindness. And that great mercy and kindness, as Wayne touched upon last week, is for us to respond and to do something with it, to change as a church, to change as a people, to change as a husband, to change as a single person, to change the way you do ministry, to change the way that you talk to people. All of it should be surrounded, everything in our minds at all times. We should be conscious of this great glory of God. It should move us. It should make life actually worth living. Shouldn't it? I mean, I hope it does. Or we're all wasting our time. Might as well pull the carpet up, Joe. Eh. Which then changes, because of this great fear and wonder, it changes our evangelism. Because all of a sudden we begin to have the heart of God that we care enough for people to save them from the coming wrath. There'll be a day when God finally says, enough. No more. And for us, who are saints in the room, it'll be such a glorious day to see Christ face to face without the mar of sin in our life, with a new fresh body that can bounce and run and play. It would be such a glorious day. But for those who have refused to repent of their sin and run to Jesus Christ, it will be a most terrible, terrible day. And as we look at the crowds of people, when you drive through downtown Truckee or along the shores of Lake Tahoe, and I do this on occasion, I just look at people. I look at them for who they are. They're people, they're human beings with a heart and a soul and a story. I told Joe this, I think, uh, a few weeks ago. I said, every time I go to a fast food restaurant and I see somebody who's in their late 50s and they're serving fast food, I tell them, that person's got a story, man. That's, I, I guarantee that's, that person's got hurt. They've got some kind of bad situation. Something happened that led them to a place where they now are no longer in a career or, or they never had a career, but now they're serving, making minimum wage to make ends meet. I'm not saying that person is less than. I'm saying my heart goes out to them. They've got a story. They're a human being. And when you see those people and you see each one of them has a story, one of them had a, some of them, one of them, some of them had a mom, some of them had a dad. That's what I was going to say. Pretty sure they all did. Unless they're Jesus, then we'll forget it. What's my point? My point is to look at the crowds of people as Jesus did and to have compassion. A sheep without a shepherd wandering aimlessly, looking for leaders, looking for someone to lead them and to guide them. Unfortunately, many have gone to social media for that, to the latest trend on Snapchat, the latest reality television show, or the latest YouTube star. When we have the greatest shepherd of all time, we have Christ, and this should change in us. Jonah's heart will continue to be wrong in chapter 4. He doesn't see the people of Nineveh as God sees them. You know, as God saw those people, as violent as they were, as children. And he says it. If you look, just to give you a preview of chapter 4, verse 11, he asked Jonah, should I not pity Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know their right hand from their left? You know, that's not a statement that the people are ignorant. What kind of person doesn't know the right hand from their left? A child. 
He's saying to Jonah, these are children. And I love them. And I want to see them in a right relationship with me. My friends, you and I should have an eye for the lost. And see them as children. Not just as violators and God-haters and homosexuals and all the ways we get frustrated with them and all the, the kind of things that we say as if we're not them. As if we were never them. We are them. We all need grace. And so we ask God, would you use me in evangelism? We share with people, God is more ready to forgive than you are ready to repent. As the worship team comes up, you guys can come on up, and if I could ask um, my elders and pastoral staff and um, Jamie, uh, if you guys come up, and um, I think uh, Ryan's here too, Ryan Benty, um, John as well, if you guys would just start handing out the uh, bread first and then the juice just as I kind of close with some thoughts. Um, and we get to partake in communion. So just go ahead and, and go for it. Um, communion, communion is the visualization of uh, the wrath of God poured out on Christ. The, the body broken and his blood shed. And we get to now partake. If you're a Christian this morning, you get to partake in this. If you're not a Christian and you don't believe in Jesus, I, I'd ask you to, to hold back. I would ask you to not partake because um, the Bible actually says that you kind of actually heap more of God's anger upon your own self by partaking in something that you don't believe in. So I wouldn't want to do that to you. If you're not a believer this morning, I, I wouldn't want to heap more wrath on you, um, even if you don't believe in that wrath. Uh, and I would also say to you if, you, if you're not a believer and you are here this morning and you're seeking, you're definitely welcome to continue to come and to experience and to learn. And I would tell you that, that the kind of language I'm using is the kind of language you would share with your friends and family. Hey, come see what this is all about. Uh, people who don't know God are, are welcome to come to the building. It always makes me laugh when someone says, I don't believe in God. And I say, will you come to church with me on a Sunday? And they say, no, because I'm afraid I'm going to get struck by something, by lightning or something. I go, wait a minute, you just said you don't believe yet you're fearful of walking into the building? Um, you got a problem, bro. You really do need church, so come. Um, and, uh, and, and so don't partake. But if you are a believer, again, this is a reminder to you that God took wrath. He's not against you. Fam, he's not against you. That's such good news. And, um, and then as they pass the juice out, I want to read because I'm not going to sing. It's a hymn. I'm not going to sing it. I didn't want to make Brad learn it within a few days. Um, but it expresses a lot of what we've talked about here and about us coming back into the arms of God, into the family of God and all of that. And it reads like this. Come, come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome. God's free bounty glorify. True belief and true repentance, every grace that brings you nigh. Come ye worry heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you'll never come at all. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. Feel him prostrate in the garden. On the ground your maker lies. On the bloody tree, behold him, sinner. Will this not suffice? Lo, the incarnate God. Ascended pleads the merit of his blood. Venture on him, venture holy. Let no other trust intrude. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior. In the arms of my dear Savior. In the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are 10,000 charms.